everyone, and welcome to another edition of Wrestling Reverb. I've got a very special edition today. It's been something I've been um, talking about for the last week or so. I've got a very special guest. I'll let him introduce himself to you all. Go go ahead. Wow, very special. Um, <laughs> yeah, so my name is uh, Levi. Uh, I run a little show called the Ruthless Aggression Podcast. And uh, I have been invited uh, by this awesome man named Josh uh, here at the Wrestle. The wrestling reverb, excuse me. Uh, so I'm, I'm really excited to be here. And just in short, my podcast is uh, a uh, to steal from the OSW gimmick, a uh, chronological critique of the ruthless aggression era. And we're trying to figure out was this an era? Can we call it an era? So yeah, that's what me and uh, my co-host Kyle, who's not here, that's what we do. So uh, yeah, very excited to be here. Oh well, I'm very excited to have you. Um, and just to I, I listen to this podcast on on the reg on the regular. Wow, I tried to sound really cool then, but it didn't work. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I listen to it all the time. It's a really good podcast. I invite everyone to go check it out because it's it's just it's. Um, th- we all know, we both know that uh, there's a lot of wrestling podcast, well, a lot of podcasts in general in the world. So um, to find something that's actually kind of just kind of different to the rest is really good, and. Um, I always go into listening to podcasts, whatever it may be, just with a you know open mind and whatever. And you guys just kind of grab my attention, so it's a really good podcast. Check it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, baby doll. I sure appreciate that. No, you know, I, you know, I'm from America, got to speak like a southerner. You know, that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> I was just telling. I was just saying before how um, you know Australians are very exposed to. Um, the American society, just without entertainment and stuff like that. Um, but I did come into this for all my Aussie listeners. I come into this. I ate some Vegemite on toast, so I'm feeling very Australian. So don't worry, Australian fans. I'm still here with you. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't worry. No, I'm going to convert Josh, and he's going to be riding a horse with his cowboy hat and eating a burger, fireworks in the sunset. That all that and all that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's 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 just dive off of wrestling questions for one second because I mean that's all I talk about is is wrestling. So, um, have you ever tried Vegemite? Well, uh, cool story. Uh, first of all, no. Second of all, um, there's just a quick plug uh, and uh, for forgive me, fans of the Wrestling Reverb, for ever exposing you to this, but there is a YouTube channel called Joey's World Tour. And uh, some of you may have heard of it. It's probably a lot of you haven't. But it's just pretty much this uh, big old beast guy from California. He goes to all these fast food restaurants and uh, he quote unquote reviews uh, products that they have in his car. And uh, he he did the Vegemite challenge, and pretty much he pretty much took like a, a pretty good portion of it and put it on, like, on a saltine cracker and just ate it. And he's like, wow, this is terrible. And all I, and from what I gained from the comments is that uh, they're like, you're an idiot. You're supposed to eat it like a little bit of it with it. So yeah, everyone. Um, so whenever I see like anyone else in the world that isn't in Australia eat Vegemite, it's generally first things first is you never eat that shit on a spoon. It's not. It's very bitter. It's salty. You never eat. <laughs> nev- you, it's nice on like a piece of toast little bit of butter and just like not some i've seen okay but just saying that i've seen some people have like a lot and it's it's disgusting i have like a little smear of it on my toast with some butter and it's just perfect but you never eat that crap with a spoon ever (laughs) it's not good (laughs) exactly so um so i maybe one day i'll try it who knows maybe maybe we'll do a, a ruthless aggression podcast and wrestling reverb live merge and uh, I'll have Vaginite then. Who knows? We'll yeah, have but, to see. Yeah, I mean, I'm always... But well, even still, I think the first time I ever ate Vegemite, I didn't like it because it's, it's very intense. But anyway, um, we should start a new podcast called the Vegemite <laughs> Podcast because... Yeah, <laughs> I'm down. <laughs> I, just, I just make you eat Vegemite on a spoon for an hour and just see what kind of torture I can put you through. Um <laughs> Um, anyway, Good so Lord, let's... I'm getting some buffalo bull bites. <laughs> <laughs> oh What's the lotion on his skin like? <laughs> oh my god, this podcast is off to a very different start. Um, 
it's just uh, I've got Vegemite on the brain, obviously. So let's just um, let's. The only way I can go from Vegemite is to um, not even try and make a segue. Let's just go right into things. Um, so you guys let's do, do the the ruthless aggression era. Um, I mean, what I can ask you is, what does that when you hear the words ruthless aggression? What's the first thing you think about? Oh boy, man. That's a great question. And uh, full disclosure, uh, in, in all seriousness, um, I was inspired to start this show from OSW Review, which is a, probably the definitive wrestling podcast, yes, in yes, my yes. opinion. Um, and more so the Attitude Era podcast. They they put on su- – those two are probably the finest wrestling podcasts I've listened to just because it's so authentic and uh, it's just it's just a good show in, in all honesty. And so I'm just like, hey, you know – at the time, I said, no one's touched the ruthless aggression, quote unquote, era. So uh, I'm going to do it. <laughs> Turns out there's like four or five podcasts on the ruthless aggression era, but like <laughs> none, of, none of them have gained any steam. Some of them quit after like SummerSlam. You know, it's just, it's, it's all different. So I'm just like, you know what? I'm passionate about this. I have a good friend in Kyle who can do this. And uh, oh, also, I missed uh, an important point. And li- in listening to these two podcasts, uh, because you know I'm a huge fan. I listen to all that they put out. They were just like, "That's not an era, the ruthless aggression era. That's not an era." And I'm just like, "Well, you know, in my opinion, it was an era. That, yeah, that's I, what I, I grew up. It's an era. I grew up on the ruthless aggression era more so than the attitude era. I I started watching rest. I mean, I've been told I watched wrestling before this, but I don't really remember too much until like 2001, 2002. So that's like that kind of time. So I grew up on that." Bro, same here. Like, I started, I I think I've mentioned this on my podcast before, but my first wrestling memory is William Regal joining the the Kiss My Butt Club. Excuse me, I don't I don't say curse words because that's just not me. But <laughs> you're right, you're <laughs> but right. You, you're picking up what I'm putting down. So, uh, yeah. Well, so I'm t- nearly 23. So watching wrestling for like 17 years, 18 years when I was a little one, but like growing up on that time. Um, you know, things to me, I don't know why, and you can, you're probably going to like, like not even believe me when I say this, but for some reason, the first two things I think of with the ruthless aggression era is evolution and Simon Dean of all things. <laughs> I just remember him trying oh, to sell no, me that, Simon sell, Dean. sell me like that workout crap that I didn't want. And I was just like, who is this jerk? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> I don't know why Dude, I think Simon- of him but I do. <laughs> no, I totally get it. And, you know, part, part of me is like, yeah, you should. You should think of Simon Dean. You should think of Simon Dean. You should think of the network executive from SmackDown. Oh, God. You should think of the boogeyman. <laughs> you know, you should think of these people. The Mexicals, you know? Oh, my God, That's... the Mexicals. I completely forgot they ever existed. <laughs> Not me, baby. <laughs> totally, totally racist. Paul Birchall. I mean, I can keep going here, but... <laughs> Okay, hold on. Time out. Paul Birchall should have gotten more over. I freaking loved him. My older brother loved Paul Birchall from what um, I can remember. He always – I was – so I – okay, I was one of those people that watched Raw a lot more than SmackDown. I watched it all like, – I appreciate SmackDown much more now as in like going back and watching it. But when I was a kid, Raw was the, you know, the show that come on. Um, we never got it live by the way, either we're a week behind all the time. So we used to get really? on a so we used to get Monday's episode the following Monday. Um huh. at like nine o'clock at night on yeah, so we used to be a week behind. Thankfully there wasn't too much of, you know, there wasn't social media and stuff then. So you could kind of watch it without knowing what's happening. If that happened now, I'd be screwed. I wouldn't it wouldn't <laughs> I'd know everything. Yeah. Like I wouldn't be able to ever watch it just to watch it. We get it live now um, through our, our cable companies, but yeah, we we used to always be a week behind. So I used to watch Raw, and I don't think SmackDown come on in Australia um, like at a prime time spot until like I want to say like two thousand and three, two thousand and four. So yeah, we never used to really get SmackDown until a little bit later. So I was always Raw first and then SmackDown come later. Right. Um, Funny story. Um, I actually uh, 
and you'll hear me talk about this in the podcast. Um, it it, it kind of drifts in and out. You know, SmackDown over here, for instance, uh, they they changed channels so often because you know UPN went out, and so they became the CW. It's like, well, you don't get the CW in your yeah. Cable I do bag actually remember, like, yeah, like SmackDown changing networks all the time as opposed to Raw. Yeah, which was so strange to me because <sighs> I don't know. But uh, once once they got off UPN, it just pretty much just was they couldn't find their home anymore. Yeah, but, it was uh, like they flip flopped so many times. I remember at one stage they went from like my network TV to like sci fi. Oh, to, I forgot about that. Wow. Do you remember yeah. at that era? And I, I don't know. That was like two thousand and eight or nine. I think it would have been roughly around oh, that that's- time. That's the PG era, brother, and I'm not touching that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hated WWE then, man. I freaking hated it, it. It certainly... WWE goes through peaks and valleys a lot. Just, you know, it, it yeah. really just does, like, we've gone... Do you still watch the current product now? Um, Not like I did... Uh, when I was younger, um, I watch YouTube clips and that's how I oh, keep yeah. up. And so you, so you still I'll kind sit down of... and watch a pay per view. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. A lot of people do that now. I, you know, people I kind of associate with. A lot of people don't watch it every week because it's just not. I mean, it's so accessible, like you said, on like YouTube and stuff like that. They can keep up with what they need to, and then just watch the pay per views. Right, and um, I think the last time I watched full time was like. Uh, 2013, 2014, around the time uh, Daniel Bryan finally won the championship. Okay, and, yeah. Yeah. So I am one of those crazy people that I watch Raw and SmackDown, NXT, uh, the May Young Classic at the moment. I watch everything pretty much every week. I sit down <laughs> and I watch it every week. And trust me, it gets brutal. It's brutal. <laughs> you brave, brave man. I know. I watch it and I just, I don't know, it's... um. I don't know, it's just so, like, ingrained in me just to watch it. And it's, I mean, some weeks are better than others. I mean, SmackDown at the moment is really good. So, like, I can watch that, no problem. And it's a two-hour show as opposed to Raw. It's kind of a chore to watch Raw, I'm not going to (laughs) lie. Well, yeah, I mean, I I know this has been said over and over again, but Three hours every week is just a little too much, especially when long they don't fill the time. They don't you, fill the time with their – No, and it's just um, like if you think of a WWE week now as opposed to, you know, 10 to even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it's it's Raw for three hours on, on a Monday night. It's SmackDown for two. Then you've got NXT for one. You've got uh, now you've got NXT UK for another one. You've got two hundred five live. You've got the May Young Classic. Um, if you take in the fact that you've got Total Divas, um, there's Ooh. wrestling on kind of nearly every day, and it's generally you know an, over an hour all the time. So there's a lot of wrestling to 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 ask everyone to watch. It's sometimes less is more. And I think they're at the stage now where it's just overexposed. Yeah, and I think as much as uh, we pine for the the older days and that sort of formatting, uh, you know, we're not going to get it because they have this deal with Fox that, you know, that's really going to come into effect next year and you're only going to see more. Yeah, and, so. you know, if they're making – they're still – you know, TV ratings are different now anyway, so it doesn't matter – as much, I mean, it still matters to some degree, but it's different now. They're driven by how many people are buying the network and how many deals they can acquire with other companies to bring in revenue. So, really, they're not focused so much on, you know, I, I wouldn't say they're not focused so much on the product because they are. Like, they have to be able to pay attention to the product, but it's just a different time, really. <laughs> Yeah, and there's really no better way to say that. It's a different time. and It's just um, what worked you know, yeah, 15 years ago wouldn't work today, and what worked now wouldn't, you know, it's just, yeah, it just wouldn't. It's a different time that we live in, in general, with everything. So it's just different. Oh, come on, Josh. You, you don't want to see Seth Rollins with, like, a Kai and Tai choppy choppy as PP? You don't want to see that <laughs> angle? 
I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, after this week, maybe not. But um, <laughs> oh man, yeah. <laughs> he's he's probably feeling it this week, so we'll give him <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but I mean, now that I, it's been a it's been a different week of of wrestling and I haven't really had an opportunity to get on the podcast and kind of talk about this but um, I won't stick on this topic for too much but obviously sending love and everything to Roman Reigns no one wants anyone to go through that kind of stuff so that's all I'll kind of say on that topic just because some people are so insensitive and I've seen some horrible comments and stuff like that it's like oh my god just uh, yeah but sending my love to him and his family and this time that he's going through Definitely, definitely, yeah. and I, I echo that sentiment. Yes. Us here at the Ruthless Aggression Podcast. Get well soon, Roman. Yeah, everyone, Um. yeah, just for the most part, the wrestling community has come together and kind of all said this kind of same thing, but there's always that couple of bad people in the bunch that just spoil it for the rest, which is unfortunate, oh, but boy. it's just how it is. It happens everywhere, and you just got to learn to kind of ignore it, I guess. But Definitely. um okay. Um let's let's talk about your kind of um expertise, which is the ruthless aggression era, which I which okay. we said before. It is an era. Um so I wanna talk about something that's um kind of you know, in um everyone's mind at the moment. Of course, this weekend is WWE Evolution, which is the first ever all women's pay per view. So if we go back fifteen years, um there was a little bit of a kind of a uh, similar kind of movement, I guess, going on with the women's division in some aspects where they were getting a chance to kind of wrestle, I guess is the word. You had your Trish Stratuses and your leaders and, and Jazz and my personal favourite, Molly Holly. Um, ah, good man. Yeah, Molly Holly. I love Molly Holly. I still love her to this day. So, And especially as, you know... Um, older i appreciated molly's work and stuff like that so i I like molly holly um but so we'll we'll start on the women's division do you think in um who do you think out of you know the last you know from now the last five years ish who do you think would have fit perfectly in 2002 2003 with trish stratus with the leaders who do you think someone that comes to your mind now that would fit then Wow, that's a great question. Um, I think the first person that comes to mind is Becky Lynch. She's um, on because fire when I, at the moment, so no pun yeah. intended. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, here's the thing. Becky Lynch, um, you know, you have so many talented wrestlers in the women's division as it is. You know, Charlotte Flair um, is probably another one that would fit there. And, um, and, and something that I would – sorry to butt in, but like um, – Charlotte Flair is getting a lot of... Everyone's talking about Becky at the moment. Like, Becky's, you know, this, and Becky's so good. But it takes two to tango, and Charlotte's played her role very, very, very well at the moment. So, um, yeah. But anyway, go on. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, man, I totally agree. Uh, they, they've done wonders with that storyline. Yeah. Uh, but just to, to keep the main thing the main thing... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, what... Uh, I like about Becky Lynch in the Ruthless Aggression era is, uh, you know, she's someone who is uh, committed to her role. She's someone uh, who can uh, be a good entertainer. We've seen, like, especially with her on the cutting edge, we know she can cut a freaking promo. Yeah, she can. And and that's key. Uh, Now, uh, what what I feel super comfortable with her, uh, knowing her as I know her now uh, in that era, because um, like like I just stated on our on uh, episode uh, Unforgiven 2002 on the Ruth Discretion podcast, uh, <laughs> she plugged there. No, um, <laughs> on Raw recently in in that uh, that time frame in September of O2, uh, they had uh, the first ever uh, lingerie pillow fight. Oh yes, and I and I, <laughs> I know I know what you may be thinking here and that's like don't they have those all the time? No. That they went on record. Eric Bischoff said that that was the first ever one. So, do I want to see Becky Lynch in a freaking pillow fight? No, I don't. I want to see her wrestle. It is, it is um, different. It is very a different time because obviously that kind of stuff doesn't happen anymore. Um, it's much more focused on what they can do inside the ring. Um, so yeah, to 
to kind of echo your point, no, I wouldn't want to see Becky Lynch do that. But would I want to see Becky Lynch wrestle people like Victoria, wrestle people like Molly Holly? But then it's a double-edged sword, I guess, because you take what the pros with the cons. Exactly. And, um, you know, they, the, those women went through a lot. They, you know, they, yeah. they ate a lot of, they ate a lot of crap, man. Cause, yeah. Cause I'm watching, I'm watching the Raws and the Smackdowns and the, you'll have matches set up by bikini contests, by, uh, pie eating contests. Yeah, it's weird things different. like that. <laughs> uh, but you know, Be- Becky's just the number one that comes to mind because she would, her attitude it's like, would fit definitely then. Um, but yeah. Well, here's the thing. What what do you do with you know, for instance, Bailey? Like, does Bailey, you know, oh, she likes to hug people. Let's make her like Eugene or someone like that. Yeah, like and it's um, it, it's muddied water. Yeah, so. Bailey is one that when I was kind of um asking the question, I was like, oh, going Bailey for some reason come to my mind, but she is so um, she is family orient- orientated. She is just that. You know, little girls can look at Bailey. It's it's weird because a lot of people give Bailey a lot of crap for what she is, but like, we're not nine year old girls. Nine to a nine year old girl, Bailey is her, their hero. She's not made for us. No. no, she's not made for she. I mean, no, like she. I think she's a she's good in the ring. I don't think she's like the best thing ever, but I think she's very good in the ring. But she is. It's so weird watching it now. I'm like, Bailey doesn't really do much for me. But like you said, she's not made for us. So, yeah. But yeah, uh, Becky Lynch is is one I feel would thrive in that era. And that's not to say, you know, because ability alone doesn't get you anywhere. It's where where the the creative direction, um, quote unquote, would lead wrestlers, you know. Because you have someone like Shelton Benjamin, for instance. and. Shelton Benjamin had a glass ceiling everywhere he turned. Uh, someone like, I don't know, even Charlie Haas. Charlie Haas had all the talent in the world, you know, and we saw that he was charismatic too, but he had a glass ceiling, you know. And I, I guess to go even further with that, like not everyone is made for the top spot. Not everyone gets gets a, gets a chance and – you think of someone like Roddy Piper, for instance. Roddy Piper was never world champion, but he's a legend, and he'll be remembered for generations yeah, to come. Exactly. So there's only there's so, only one top spot. Not everyone can be in that top spot, but there's you know multiple other spots, and every single little crack needs to be filled. Exactly, and we need, what we need in wrestling is wrestlers committed to to filling spots like. I, th- I think it was Lance Storm on Twitter recently. Uh, he said something to the effect of uh, wrestlers either wanted the last match on the show or the first match, because the first match you got a, a you know a white hot crowd that you know that's ready to see some wrestling, and yeah, so yeah, yeah. people would be like, I don't want to go on first. I'll be the curtain jerker. Like you know, it's it's perception, and you know we're not wrestlers, so we don't get the full grasp of it. But like you can't sit there and say everyone should be the world champion, like. I don't think Zack Ryder should be the world champion. You Actually, know, no, be- so, funny that you bring up Zack Ryder. I listen – sometimes when I'm just, you know, going on long drives and stuff like that, I listen to, you know, Steve Austin's podcast or um, Lillian Garcia's podcast. He was recently on Lillian Garcia's podcast and, you know, she was kind of talking about how he's, you know, not the world champion. And he kind of said what you just kind of said. Basically, he just said – not everyone is meant to be the world champion. You know, there's other things that um, need to be, you know, filled. There's other people to to wrestle. There's other shows that need to be, you know, like your main events and stuff like that. Um, So he kind of talked about how, like, he had his moment as, like, the US champion and he won the Intercontinental Intercontinental title and and whatever. So um, to kind of just, like, go over what you just kind of said... He does agree that not everyone is meant to be the world champion, and more people need to kind of. Um, y- you should be in the business to you know be at the top. However, um, to get to the top, you have to fill all those other spots. You have to work your way up to that. Yeah, it's a team effort, right? Yeah, if it's if it's a, if it's a good show from start to finish, then it helps everybody, not just a good main event, not just a good fourth match, third match, whatever it may be. 
Exactly. It, it reminds me a lot of uh, pro football. I don't know how big y'all are into the NFL in uh, Australia. <laughs> I mean, but, uh, I mean, I'm not personally, but I kind of know what the kind of um. But you anyway, go on. I can. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, first of all, hashtag tighten up, go Titans. Anyway, that being said, uh, you have stories kind of like that all the time. Uh, for instance, uh, the Titans had a quarterback, uh, Vince Young. Um, just in the off chance that someone knows. You don't have to know anything about football to understand what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, Vince Young was uh, this, this quarterback. He, uh, You can look this up on YouTube. He played uh, the greatest game of college football in history. That's not my opinion. That's uh, it's, it's like lore in college football. Uh, Vince Young is synonymous with that game. So the Titans drafted him uh, to, be, to play for them, and uh, he was plagued by a bad coach. Uh, he had a lot of differences with the coaching, uh, and the coach held him back, that sort of thing. And um, eventually, his career just squandered. And uh, you know, he made two Pro Bowls, which is you know a high achievement in football. He had multiple game-winning drives, all these sorts of things. And um, he's a big what if in the National Football League. Like, what could his career done? Because we saw what he did in college. And we saw a flash of what he could be in the pros, but uh, all these things held him back, so we'll never know. So um, I hate to sound so like it's destiny, that sort of thing, but may- maybe Zack Ryder is destined to just be the star of main event and uh, obscure. And we'll always remember him as this wrestler who really flashed in 2011 and won the United States Championship, and that was it. Does it suck? Absolutely, because we know that there were forces behind that, uh, aka the the writing team, uh, holding him back and putting him in, you know, embrace the hate and all that sort of stuff. Oh boy, yeah, <laughs> oh, that was it. But, he, talked um, about, he actually talked about that on Lillian's podcast, and basically he just was like, uh, "I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know what that was." <laughs> Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, he, he, like he basically that. said, because um, Lillian was basically asking him, um, you know, what did you think about that? And he was like, I was in that storyline with Kane and, and John Cena and Eve. And he actually, cre- like, kind of gets on himself because he never went to Vince McMahon himself and asked, where is this going? He just kind of went with it and kind of hoped for the best. So, yeah. I, I can't believe he took that bump on the wheelchair oh yeah that was oh that was nasty i cringe every time i see it yeah um, how 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 do they approve of that i i I really don't know how you protect yourself on that there's no way to brace (laughs) you don't really right (laughs) you just kind of hope and you just kind of go with it and yeah hope you don't break something but let us never forget when kane choke slammed zack Ryder through the stage and we come back from break, and Michael Cole says, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I have the unfortunate news to tell you that Zack Ryder broke his back. <laughs> In all seriousness. I what? remember. He did not break his back. Oh, my gosh. What? <laughs> oh, oh, man. Geez. And then it all – but don't worry. It all led to Zack Ryder's big moment at that year's WrestleMania when he got kicked in the nads by Eve Torres. Yep, WrestleMania moment right there. Or as we just said in our our last episode on the podcast, WWE Live, the moments waiting. Get out of here. Come on. (laughs) That's like them drilling into our heads right now that it's the WWE World Cup to determine the best in the world. And if you don't say it in that sentence every damn time, then it's just not real. (laughs) Yeah, it's just like, uh, what's it called? Uh... Uh, this Sunday at Survivor Series, the one night of the year where Raw oh. and SmackDown superstars go head to head in Mortal Kombat. Oh, it's like, <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> like, stop. We know, we know you're reading a script. Stop. Just shut the hell up. Like, it's just, like, <laughs> oh my god. They just drill things into your head. Like every time they they promote Evolution, it's the first ever all women's pay per view WWE Evolution. It's like. Just call it evolution and move the hell on. Like, <laughs> uh, here's a sloppy pay per view we threw together with a battle royal and a uh, tag team match. Here you go. Don't even. <laughs> I, I mean, I one of my main things. Um, people know that listen to my podcast all the time. I love women's wrestling. Always have. Always have su- supported it. 
and whatever. And this pay-per-view should be a lot bigger than it is being presented. Yes, you've got your couple of main matches, but a battle royal? Like, come on. That's the epitome of, of Messi. It's like, just like, I understand, I understand trying to get everyone on the show. I'm not, it's not even about that. But like, like why would Michelle McCool want to be in a battle royal to win a future women's title shot? Like, why should we believe that she will win? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, she's, oh. she's, she's so post, like, removed from wrestling. Why would we believe that she wants to win this? Or, like, why would, you know, Medusa or Alundra Blaze, whatever it, it you want to call It could be a Goldberg story, you know? <laughs> It Michelle could be a McCool's Goldberg big story, comeback, you know. <laughs> hey, Molly Holly's in that, so <laughs> well, trust me when I say I'm going for Molly Holly. <laughs> there you go. Same here. But to be fair, do do we not mark out for this at every Royal Rumble? Like, am I supposed to believe the Hurricane wants a title shot? Is I mean, going yeah, to get a title in that, shot? In that no. respect, yeah, I, I I I get it as well. But then when people like Oscar and Nia Jax are in that battle royal, when Nia Jax could be wrestling someone like Beth Phoenix or even Tamina, like, that's kind of a story there. Like, I mean, there's just so Dude, many Josh, more opportunities. Stop being logical. Stop. Yeah, there's just, it's not going to get you anywhere. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just like, come on. Like, enough with this lazy booking. Like, just put some effort into it. You've announced this since July. I'm sure you've had some time to think about what matches you want to put together. But, you know, whatever. We just watch. I'm still going to watch it. I'm still going to enjoy it. Whatever it may be. Okay, question question for you uh, mm-hmm. from me. Um, do you think because uh, the 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 card was supposedly leaked? I don't know if you saw that. Or I, not, I, I remember back. skimming over it. <laughs> uh, do you think that had any effect on the eventual outcome being changed of, of what we know the card to be now? Do you think that had any effect on it? Well, um. That's a really good question because I feel like with um, WWE sometimes when things are leaked, they do purposely change things just to be like, you don't know anything. Like, we are in control of you. You don't know what's happening. We've got the cards that are being dealt. Um, So, I mean, it definitely could have because I recall seeing... Was Ronda and Nikki on that? I think it was. Yep, yep. But then there was, like, a, I believe seeing a battle royal to determine the number one contender to the NXT Women's Championship. I think that was on there. Um, and then, I mean, yeah, it really could have because that seemed like a fairly believable card, to be honest. Yeah. From what I, I, I remember totally of it anyway. It. Yeah. I, I When I actually read it, I generally th- remember thinking, like, yeah, this is pretty balling. Like, this is should be a good show. And then we got what we got. Uh, so here's a, here's a, a side question for you. Or um, let, me, let me do my co-host, Kyle. Uh, let me do him justice. <laughs> With a aggression side question. <laughs> uh, here's the thing. On that same card was uh, the well-rumored recorded, recorded. What am I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> the, the heavily rumored WWE Women's Tag Team Championship. Oh, yes. Do you think we get swerved and we see that still? Mm, okay, so I'm I think I'm yeah to answer your question, yes. I think we do still see it and I think it will happen at Evolution. I think that tag match with um Trish and Lita will end up being a tag title match. Um Ooh. but here's my okay, I get I, when I talked about this episodes and episodes ago on on Wrestling Reverb, I um was not in favor of having women's tag team titles, which coming from me, who's, you know, a huge women's wrestling fan, um, a lot of people kind of got on me for it, but only because the only reason I think it's like (sighs) quality over quantity. I don't just want random teams just popping up in the women's division just for the sake of women's tag team titles. Like, I just don't think, yes, there's a lot of women currently, but I just don't think there's enough quality, like, meaningful tag teams to have a tag division. Do you get me? Oh, absolutely. I absolutely agree. I just don't think it just should be a thing. Like, if they do bring in women's tag team titles, they should. it should really mean, you know, that they're really having a tag team division. If you look at the way they kind of have tag the, the male tag team divisions, 
um, especially on Raw, they're just kind of there. They're not really an integral part. So you think they're going to put, you know, more effort into the the Raw SmackDown women's titles. Um, They're going to put less effort into the tag team titles and it'll just become so... um, just It'll just mean not mean a lot. Oh, come on. You know exactly where you were when you saw the Revival go one-on-one with the Ascension. I mean, two-on-two. Oops, I forgot where I was. (laughs) See, tag team wrestling. It's just, it's just, they're so, like, you look at the tag teams in, um, you know, well, in the Attitude Era, at least, you know, Edge and Christian, all that, it was, you know, right up there with the main kind of deal. Like, yeah, I know we just saw a tag team match, um, main event Raw and stuff like that, but it's not, it wasn't really about the tag team championships. There's so much more going on. And I just think that, like, the tag team titles are such an afterthought that I wouldn't want the girls to get it, and then it's even less of an afterthought than what it is now. Just the cruiserweight title, essentially. Yeah, like, like uh, 205 Live is probably the only show I don't watch in full every week. And I, I, it's just, like, the last thing on my mind. Like, I just need sometimes a break from watching wrestling, and it's just, unfortunately, that gets my firing line. <laughs> it's just like process totally of elimination understand. it's just like i'm not like saying they're probably putting on the best matches of the whole week but it's like why do i care like there's just so much that i have to watch i totally understand uh 205 live has never gotten a second out of me i can i, I think I've i can watched, tell you that i think much. i've watched maybe one episode completely all the way through maybe i think it was the first episode <laughs> Other than and you're that, like, screw this. Yeah, I'm like, this is like, I'm like, this is not worth putting up another hour of my life for this. <laughs> no, no, we need we need cruiserweights who mix it up with uh, the other dudes, people yeah, out of their like, way. Why class. do they only exclusively have to wrestle each other? Why can't we see, you know, a whoever a, a Cedric Alexander wrestle a Seth Rollins? How good would that be? That would be so. Oh good. my gosh! Uh, that fantasy booking. That that oh, would I love be so that. good. I love that. Please make like, this happen. So it would be so good. <laughs> Even like, you know, well, this is now I'm just see that come off the top of my head. And now I'm thinking about it and I'm like, oh, do I want to see? Actually, I do want to see Braun Strowman wrestle some of these guys. Hell yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> no, because what they would do is they would have Braun Strowman versus uh, Kalisto. And I mean, that uh, already happened. Lee if Strato. you remember that dumpster match and Kalisto won. <laughs> He freaking won. I forgot won. about that. He won I that forgot, match. I about that. <laughs> so your fantasy Wait, he won? happened. He, he won? Did, he did win. I remember him and then Braun just like destroyed him after. He won that dumpster match. It was in, was it in London? I remember uh-huh. it and he won. He like pushed him he or won? something. He fell into the dumpster and then Braun went crazy. I generally remember him winning. Huh. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah, Generally. maybe it's like a swerve thing because yeah, like, it, was it was like, like it was like so like something. unexpected and like he just won like Braun fell and like Callisto got him or some some you know BS like that. But he definitely won. Wow. Okay. Um, I mean, honestly, I think Braun Strowman is a little lame. Uh, I mean, he's definitely dropped off. Right there. He he's definitely dropped off of what he was. He was so full of momentum, you know, maybe like six, seven months ago. And ugh, I think that WrestleMania thing kind of was where I dropped off with him when he was, I, as much as it was cool to see a 10 year old kid wrestle at WrestleMania. But, oh, um, geez. No. <laughs> oh God. Very, no. Sarca- <laughs> very sarcastic there. Um, he, Nicholas, Nicholas. <laughs> it was just like, what the hell is this? Like you couldn't have thought of like, anybody else but like a 10 year old kid but whatever but that's where i kind of uh tapped out with braun i was like okay this is this is the start of where you're starting to dip for me okay so full disclosure uh, i follow uh braun Strowman's uh uh shoot instagram oh, account so, do so I. it's like oh my god it's amazing out of fame. <laughs> well here, here's the thing this is just something i can't get past with braun Strowman. um I don't know if you have people like this, like, you know, when you went to high school or whatever. Or Do, do, do they call it high school in Australia? They do. they do. call it something else? Yeah, it's high school. Okay. So, um, 
I had, I had several people that I went to high school with uh, who were just like kind of lame and gross, and but they always tried so hard to fit in and thought they were like the cool guy. Braun Strowman and and shoot reminds me of that kind of person, oh, and wow. I see it. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I see it. I see it translated into his character too. Like for instance, when uh, he came out there, and like I I have no doubt that he is friends with Roman. Or, you know, they're at least great acquaintances and that he cares about Roman. But, like, for him to, in character, be like, Oh, if Roman Reigns gets a top shot, he comes back. Just, first of all, that sounds hokey as all get out. That sounds uh, like, oh, he, he's real popular. He's my friend. You know, that kind of thing. It's just uh, something about it just made me cringe. It's like, come on, dude. I, uh, keep the main thing the main thing. Braun, like, like, thinking about that and what you just kind of said, he does really fit that description to a T like he just looks like the he looks like the guy that kind of almost like wouldn't shower every day like he would just kind of smell <laughs> and like he would be like hey guys and you'd be like oh here comes that kid over here and he's just big and like I don't know but then I picture it and I only can picture big Braun Strowman with a big beard in my school but like little me like <laughs> Right, and he's just that type of guy. He's like, yeah, me and Shannon, we're texting. We're going out. And you're like, like, I don't oh. care. Go away from me. Like, that's what I – like, go play. Totally <laughs> sent some nudes, you know. So much. <laughs> that's definitely <laughs> him. Uh, now, every time I see his Instagram, I'm going to be like, oh, God, like this guy, like, oh, Getting no. Out. Yeah. <laughs> I, think we, I think we might get an old unfollow from my Instagram when he is. <laughs> like, I ain't following you. Screw you, dude. <laughs> Oh my no, god! But I'm gonna. That's where the bearing stops. I think Braun is, um, man. I really loved his his initial run where he was just dominating everyone, even when it was like really stupid, like him surviving being crushed by a dumpster. But yeah, and like the, oh my god, and the main he, thing is Roman like drive an ambulance into somewhere and try to like hurt him or something. That Braun just comes out of an ambulance and he's like, yeah, like that. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> right, but here's the thing, like. What does that matter when you can't beat Brock Lesnar or Roman Reigns for a number one contender shot or, or whatever it is? Like, what does that matter when you can't yeah, it win the big one? Just, um, it just kind of hinders what he he's doing. And then there's all this build to no reward almost. Exactly. And that's when you jump the shark. And so now he can have all the, to me at least, the, as the quote-unquote modern casual wrestling fan. Uh, you can win as many matches as you want. You can destroy as many people as you want. But to me, you haven't won anything important. Yeah. You won the greatest Royal Rumble. What does that mean? Though? What did you it, get out it of that? Means he got a trophy. Diddly squat. He got like a, a green championship belt that looked like a snake. <laughs> and he got a big trophy <laughs> that got broken on an episode of Raw. Like, who cares? Whoa, really? It got yeah, broken? Yeah, it did. Um, I, I want to say... I can't even remember who is in a match against, but someone got shoot thrown into it and it broke the side off of it. And then we never seen that trophy again. Oh, jeez. So, yeah, um, it got broke. But I don't remember ever seeing that green championship again. I never recall seeing that after the Greatest Royal Rumble. It's probably like, this is from Saudi Arabia. Screw this, boy. Yeah, well, I <laughs> there's so much going on with that at the moment. I'm just like, please just... Uh, it's just not Crown Jewel is what next week I believe next Friday. Oh wow! Okay. And tickets aren't even on sale in Saudi Arabia. Really? They haven't released tickets because apparently they're holding off because they don't know what's going on with all the you know the drama that's going on over there. So it's a week and a half away, and there's no tickets being sold. Well, here's the thing: are they? contractually allowed to do that like because i know there's a lot of like you know controversy and everything and it's terrible what's going on over there is terrible but didn't they sign like a 10-year deal to that's what to i thought like, over there? Um, like i always say like i don't want them to go over there and stuff like that but at the end of the day they not might not be contractually allowed to not go there so it's easy for everyone including myself to say you know can this put it somewhere else but they might be in a spot where they just they can't go anywhere else exactly and 
I, I guess this is nothing more than like a PR move to kind of save face as, as much as they can. But at the end of the day, um, what we do know is they do have some sort of deal or agreement and they can't just back out on moral principle because first of all, they have little moral principle. Second of all, uh, you know, these things are binding. They can, they will sue the pants off of them if they don't do it. Yeah. So the things they, they just can't up and leave and people don't really understand that. No. And I'm like, so on, I, since you don't watch Raw and SmackDown every week, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but when they promote crown jewel on Raw or SmackDown or whatever it may be, they don't say, you know how they always say like, um, this play it's happening here or it's happening in Brooklyn or it's happening in wherever they don't say Saudi Arabia. They just say at the WWE crown jewel event. So they're not, they're trying to, um, I think kind of wander around all the controversy that's going on and just kind of trying to sweep it under the rug, but it's not really working. Oh, well, you know, good and well, if they say Saudi Arabia, everyone's going to be like, boo, boo, boo. Oh, well, every and, time someone um, even mentions Crown Jewel um, to the live crowd, it gets booed. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, even Undertaker on SmackDown last week said Crown Jewel, and it got booed. Well, that's not as bad as the one time the Undertaker said, the progressive city of Jeddah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah that I happens, think right? progressive. I definitely think of of Jeddah. That's definitely where my mind goes. <laughs> it's just, uh, I mean, it's just so different to, you know. I'm not trying to offend anybody or say anything about different cultures and stuff like that, but it's just so different to, you know, our kind of countries <laughs> that it's just kind of like morally something that I'm just like, ugh. Absolutely, absolutely. I, yeah. I totally agree with that. Um, well, let's um, talk about something a little less contra. Well, I mean, it. I mean, the, the ruthless aggression era had its own um, controversies, I guess, with the way you look at some of the content. But um, when you when you look back at all the years of kind of the ruthless aggression, we talked about how I thought about Simon Dean and evolution and and whatever it may be. But what's kind of the um, a significant moment, not a match, not a not a specific person, but what's like kind of a moment that kind of is always stuck in your mind when you think of that time? That's a great question, and I have two answers for you. The first one being um, an easier one, uh, because we've uh, actually reviewed this in our SummerSlam 2002 review, uh, and because I had this on tape, uh, a friend of my mom actually uh, recorded SummerSlam uh, back in the day on a VHS tape and gave it to me and I never got access to pay-per-views because I couldn't afford them. And uh, so it was just, I watched it all the dang time. So that one's, that whole pay-per-view is engraved in my head. But uh, just one of the most important things is, you know, Shawn Michaels comes back from five years of inactivity in wrestling and uh, he beats Triple H in this huge knockdown drag out fight, a uh, non-sanctioned match. And uh, just him winning and Jerry Lawler not being just like a just like a hokey idiot and not talking about puppies all the time, and him actually calling a match and doing a darn good job, and uh, Jr. just on his A game, and just even after the fact when Triple H just nails him with the sledgehammer, it felt uh, and just, it felt like it was this was a real moment. <laughs> yeah, Jim Ross was just saying Triple H is going to burn in hell and just stuff like that, and you just you felt every bit of it. Yeah, um, that, yeah. But um, I would say uh, one that's more obscure is just face Randy Orton post uh, uh, exile from Evolution. Oh my god! Yeah, that's something uh, you because don't really think about that much because when you so think of Randy I was, that time, he's so like cocky, young, you know, Randy Orton. Yeah, yeah. So that's um, so I was in fifth grade at the time. And uh, I really looked at Randy Orton then as just like this somewhat of a hero just because he had this like, dude, Burning My Light was an awesome song. Oh, he just yes, had this glorious, he had this glorious entrance. He was, he was so freaking cool. I loved Randy Orton. And, and there's this moment when uh, I, I don't remember everything surrounding it, but uh, they, the, the raw locker room, heels and faces that just had enough Triple H. And so... After a match, they all uh, corner him so where he can't escape. So they're like in the audience, so he has to get backed into the ring. And it's Randy Orton, 
Chris Benoit and I think Maven of all people uh, just all hit their finishers and all the wrestlers are surrounding the ring. They're just like getting hype and Randy hits an RKO on Triple H. It's just an awesome moment and I'll never forget it. And it's just it's engraved in me. <laughs> it's it's, <laughs> it's weird so how, obscure too. It's so it's so weird how it can be, you know, for things like that and just like you we've all watched so much wrestling that we we don't we forget about it. We always remember it when it's brought up. Like you're talking about that. I generally can remember that. But like we forget so many things. Like for me, like moments like um there's easier ones like, you know, Eric Bischoff being announced as the Raw GM. That's always a pivotal bit thing, but everybody kind For of sure. remembers that. And, you know, like, um, you know, a big moment for me is like, and everyone remembers this too, is Trish and Lita main eventing Raw. That was always like, I was always a fan of the girls. I always wanted more for them and stuff like that. Even as a kid, I always wanted, like, I was like, these girls should be getting more kind of opportunities and stuff like that that isn't them just kind of taking off their clothes and whatever it may be. Um, but it, that's always a thing. But then I think of things like um, uh, Kurt Angle and uh, with the... Um, the tranquilizer with Big Show and JBL and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I remember all of that. <laughs> like, I remember that so well. Because I that was when, you know, just after we first got SmackDown, and this was kind of the storyline that we were going with. I'm like, hell yeah. Like, as a 10-year-old kid, I'm like, this big idiot is just getting hit with a tranquilizer dart and whatever it may be. And <laughs> I genuinely remember that. And felt so bad for Big Show because he got his head shaved too, right? Yeah. They knocked him out and shaved his head. It was just so nasty. It was just like, oh my god. (laughs) What are you doing? (laughs) Oh my god. Poor Big Show. (laughs) Big Show. That's another... I mean, he just doesn't go away, does he? He's just like a fly and he just keeps coming back and you're like, alright, Big Show. As cool as you are, like 15 years ago, like, just chill out. As cool as you never were, please leave. <laughs> never, were you never really a Big Show kind of fan? No, the end. No. <laughs> no you, know um, you know what? You don't even have to elaborate. I understand. <laughs> like, exactly. Who do you think is, um, from that era, do you, who do you think is the best big man of that kind of time? Because you had people like Big Show and, and Kane and, and whatever, but is there one that kind of sticks out in your mind? Nathan Jones. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. No. Oh, my God. That's one time where I'm, <laughs> I'm like, sorry. I'm like, am I Australian still? Like, oh, he can. <laughs> uh. <laughs> he was a lot. Sorry. And it was just like, I watched, I actually watched WrestleMania. Is it 19? Yeah, it's 19 with him. Yes. I watched that maybe two, two or three months ago. And I genuinely forgot that he ever was there. And I was like, oh, man, like, this is a lot. And he's just standing there with that goofy face that he has. And I'm just like, oh, just (laughs) get out of here. Like, what are you doing? And it's just kind of, he just kind of fizzled out. Like, he just didn't want it, I don't think. (laughs) Um, Let me, let me answer your question genuinely. um, Because it's, it's actually, it's a hard one. Um, It is because big guys, I've never really been that like really enamored with i've never really been into like the big super you know heavyweights okay i'm gonna be brutally honest with you um because this probably make a lot of people laugh but um as as a child because this this is ruthless aggression but it kind of transcends that as well um just based on his longevity and uh but as a child who had access to wwf no mercy for the nintendo 64 Ooh, what a game Best wrestling game ever. Fight oh, me if, yeah, if, yeah, if you don't agree with me. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, there were, you know, everyone, everyone was Viscera, so oh. uh, he was on there. I was genuinely scared of Viscera as a child. Oh my like, god, I, Viscera! Yes, I had nightmares about Viscera. Turns out, uh, you know, because we didn't we didn't have DVR, internet was weird and new. Uh, so what I saw of Viscera, um, which was very little. Um, like I had to rent VHS tapes and stuff like that. Um, I just knew this big, intimidating, scary guy. I, yeah, yeah. Now that we have the network, now now that we have the network and everything, it's just like, oh, he kind of sucked. He was kind of lame. But I'm just like, man, I'll, Viscera to me will always be this huge dude who had, you know, a limited move set, but 
for instance, his heel, his heel kick or whatever you want to call it, is very impressive for a guy his size. You know, he's five hundred pounds, however much he weighs. Yeah, it is. And, <laughs> and so, Viscera to me, um, at least from ninety percent nostalgia and ten percent reality, I would say he was a pretty darn good big man uh, because you know he was talented. He could hang. Uh, it's just you know it turns out he lost and then he kind of deviates onto this weird world's largest love machine oh slash. Oh my god, with him um, and Lillian Garcia. Do you? Rem- oh my god, when he just bro, wanted to. Oh, absolutely. That is, <laughs> that's when he gave me nightmares. Like my lord, holy god, like just that was a lot. <laughs> what was worse, that or Big Daddy V with his titties all out? Oh, which yeah. was worse? Oh my god. Oh, <laughs> and that just makes me think of WWE ECW, and that's just another nightmare that. I never want to kind of really, uh, I didn't like that. A lot of people don't. I think I'm in the majority, but I mean, I'm in the minority. I could, we should definitely do a whole episode based on WWE CW. My older brother absolutely loved WWE CW or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> he loved, um, Kevin Thorne. Loved him. Oh man. My older Marcus brother Corvon was, was my favorite uh, for a while. Yep. See, my older brother loves all that kind of stuff. I just was just like, okay, there's uh CM Punk. There yeah, was, oh, although oh. I did like John Morrison, but then that was him with Johnny Nitro and stuff like that. So I knew who he kind of was. I liked John Morrison. <laughs> he couldn't talk. It's kind of him. muddied by Crispin Wall. Yeah, and all murdering that kind his of, family, you know, yeah, like that kind of gets in there, and then you're like, uh, yeah, it's it's just awkward. <laughs> and then you like think of like Matt Hardy as ECW champion and stuff like that, and you're like, oh boy, that gets into that oh, Christian, and it's just a, it's a mess by the end. You're right, and and but like back then, that is the brand I I represented because I I just wanted something different. It was wanted, different. Oh yeah, it was different. And I mean, different for all the wrong reasons, correct? <laughs> but like, I I just wanted to like see someone like I don't know Batista go to ECW and just do something different. I I like I remember watching the draft. I don't remember. I think oh eight or oh nine. And they just lost all their top guys, just straight up. I'm Is just that like, the year this they lost sucks. like Bobby Lashley and all of that went over. I think so. I can't remember exactly. I know they lost CM Punk. They lost Kane. Like they lost their active champion. It was it was a mess, man. Yeah. It was and just then, so bad. And it was just yeah. It was the, you could tell where the effort was, and it wasn't there. It was kind of like they were just letting the ship sh- uh, this the ship sink and. They were just like, let's just get past it and get onto something else. Okay, here's something for your viewers. Uh, some of y'all may remember the Eight Bit Boy on YouTube. Go look up uh, Taz hates the draft from the Eight Bit Boy. It's so funny because it's just him reacting to all of that misfortune. That night. <laughs> so funny. Taz, oh, now it's making me think about Mike Adamley. Holy oh no, God, like, don't bring. That's Jamaican just, me crazy. I was just literally, oh my god! You, I'm so glad you took those words out of my mouth because I didn't want to say them. <laughs> but uh, that was a. And then when he became the Raw GM, oh, good god, that was was oh. See, watching like the ruthless aggression era, um, you should feel very like happy that you watched then and didn't watch the Raw guest host era because that was something else. Oh, I actually did, uh, in and out, and oh. I freaking hated it. But, you know, again, the PG era, it was so, so bad. It just was just such a in-between time. Like, they just didn't have much direction. I just felt it lacked direction. I think now, um, well, at least for me, I feel like WWE as a whole, for the most part, is in a better spot than it, what it was th- three years ago or whatever. I think. I agree. I think we're on a little bit of an upswing. There's a lot more um, just interest, I guess, from other demographics and stuff like that. And I just think we are in a little bit of a better time. But who knows, you know, all of us wrestling fans always kind of try to, well, for the most part, think of the negative. And it's like, how long will this last before we're in a rut again? But... I mean, I try to yeah. look at it. I try to look at it in like the good side of things, and it's like there is a lot of good in wrestling at the moment, which is kind of getting me excited again. But I mean, there definitely was a phase where it was just crap all round. 
But yeah, it's um, just it's just yeah. The guest host era was. You just had the Bellas come out with a different celebrity every week, and they were just like, <laughs> they didn't know what was going on for the most part. Um, like, I generally was in love when, like, former WWE talent ran the show for the week, because you're like, thank God, someone who knows what pro wrestling is. Like uh, Seth Green. I, I guess he's the first one that comes to mind. Seth Green, uh, Bob Barker when he was like, but that was cool when he was with Chris Jericho. That was a funny one. That was yeah. a funny one. But then he had like Ozzy Osbourne and he said Evan Braun and you're like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when they had that? Didn't they do like Got Talent or something in the ring? Like, oh, that's some kind of part yeah, I try yeah. to like erase from my memory. They had that and uh, Jack Nicholson of all people was on there once and oh they're like, God. oh hey. Yeah, they had a, hey, old Jack Nicholson, how's it feel to be on Raw? And he's like, eh, it's all right. <laughs> Literally, and that's it. That's oh all they got. Oh, my God, that was such a rough time. Um, you know, um, And President Donald Trump uh, was, uh, he Trump owned Raw. Raw it was commercial free, from what I remember. <laughs> Trump Raw for one week, and then he got fired. <laughs> so I mean, weird. Donald so bizarre. Donald Trump is, um, obviously, I don't have to um, worry too much about him directly because he's not the president of my country but i mean lucky you <laughs> yeah um it's uh that was a weird i remember that being all over the news in australia when he got elected so i could imagine I mean, what you guys are going through so um I, i'm not gonna get too political here oh of course but, um it, it was so it was so crazy i lived in uh, a seattle which is um we call the, that the pnw the pacific northwest here in yep. america and um, pretty much what where um, I grew up was the southeast uh, in Tennessee, uh, home of Jerry Lawler, uh, oh. for instance. Um, so, you know, I'm very much a southerner. And so going to the PNW was like a culture shock. And so uh, you have conservatives where I grew up and you have liberals uh, where I lived for a short amount of time. And, uh, yeah, it was just like. It was you could just feel the tension everywhere, uh, just of like people hating Donald Trump. Which you know, in the southeast, they don't love Donald Trump per se, but uh, it's it so crazy, man. Because you don't, you didn't just see it on the news; you, you lived it. You, yeah. you lived that tension all the time. It would be um, America to me is just a very um, it's it's similar. Like, in a way, I believe. I've never been to the States. It's somewhere I'd like to go. But um, it's similar in a lot of ways because we're both very um, – what's the word? It's just – yeah, it's just very similar in some ways and so different in others. And it's just a very um, – yeah, it's just a weird world we live in, I guess. <laughs> Things in Australia ain't as good as the South, boy. <laughs> <laughs> There, there's my uh, angry southerner rant for the night. The end. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, to- totally up to you if you if you want to leave that bit in or not. Totally up to you. <laughs> oh, trust but me. anyway, uh, continue. Um. So, were you always uh? Well, even if you you might not even had a preference, but were you more a Raw or a SmackDown guy during the ruthless aggression era time? SmackDown all the way, baby. Yeah, uh, my def- my sister actually, um, she was super into Raw. Shawn Michaels was her favorite wrestler. She had everything Shawn Michaels. So I'm like, yeah, I rep SmackDown. Let's go, Brock Lesnar, Stephanie, man. That's my jam right there. I was Team Blue all day. SmackDown was just, um, you know, like I said before, watching it, I was all kind of Raw when I was a kid. But watching it now, or you know, in the last few years, um, SmackDown was just the better product. It was just producing better stars it was had better storylines better matches whatever it may be um see my favorite of all time and as as a kid still is now is chris jericho my favorite wrestler of all time so he was always he was for the most part always on raw um so i was always i loved him and i love rob van dam and van dam was kind of more raw at the start went to smackdown a little bit later but um you know, watching SmackDown now, you had, you know, the quote-unquote SmackDown 6. Um, so my question to kind of you is, is what six guys would you take from now that would kind of fit that role? Oh, okay. Um, 
if you can, of course, there might not even be a six guys, six guys that you could really choose for that kind of role, I guess. I, de- I definitely have an answer. Um, number one, Kevin Owens. I Good think choice. he would be perfect. I think it'd be perfect for that because he has, he has a, a, an attitude towards him and he's just a talented wrestler. Uh, I think he would fit in any story, uh, any match. Just he's just so well rounded. Um, Sami Zayn, not just because he's friends with Kevin <laughs> Owens, but because he can fit all of those things too. Uh, Shinsuke Nakamura. Um, yeah. As long as it's Shinsuke that we got at his NXT debut, because <laughs> let's yeah. be honest, we haven't seen. We yeah, haven't seen anything close. You to that. don't really, and to see anything close, you actually have to see the dude. He's not really on television that often, and he's the United States champion. <laughs> yeah, crazy how that works. Mm. Um, um, let's see those three guys. Um, then we have to throw a cruiserweight in there or a couple. So I would say um, maybe T.J. Perkins. Maybe I'm a little cons- I'm a little concerned. I think he's so talented. Uh, as far as wrestling ability, but I would like to see something different with the character. Yeah. But I think he he kind of he kind of sniffs that SmackDown Six area. Um, Cedric Alexander, as you stated earlier, I think he'd be great for that. But again, I'd like to see a little something different with his character. Um, but which character isn't always everything? No, no, uh, no, no, no. Especially not wrestling. It's not professional acting or anything. As much as they try to push it to be. Yeah. Um, two more. Um. Seth Rollins, as much as I cringe at the guy, he's super talented, uh, and I think maybe with something different, he would really excel. Uh, as far as again, character <laughs> character wise, Seth Rollins is probably one of the most talented wrestlers in the world right now. Really is, yeah. But his I character makes too, me yeah. cringe. Yeah. Um, and one more, I would say. Let me think. Let me think. It's on the tip of my tongue. Um. Ah, shoot. Hold on, give me like five seconds. You're all good. You're all good. Four, three, two. Uh, Johnny Gargano. That's who it was. Oh, that. See, I I can I've got kind of mine in my head, and I do agree with you. I agree. With, I, I see where you're coming from. Why would you? Why you would put definitely um, Owens? I definitely see Kevin Owens. He could. He can just kind of fit anywhere. You kind of put him in any spot, and he would roll with it. He would make it work. Um, yeah. So oh, I don't know if this is going to go down well, but we'll see. I would put the Miz in there. And the only reason I say The Miz is because you look at Miz today versus ages ago, and he's almost two very different performers. Miz is very versatile in, you know, fitting in any kind of spot. Um, So I'd put Miz in there. Good Um, choice. Let's see, let's see. I probably would put Seth in there. Seth is, but for the same reasons as you, he does need a little bit more character-wise. He's very stale at the moment, I think, is a, is a fair assessment. He's just very stale. Just stays in the same spot, kind of like character-wise, and doesn't really show too much more than what he's giving. Um, but it's very talented in the ring. Very, very, very. Um, who else? Cruiserweight-wise... Um, See, this is what we get for not watching 205 Live. I know. I know. See, I don't really think I'd put TJ in there. Um, I am under the impression that I've seen everything that TJ has. I don't think there's too much more that he has to give. Do you get what I mean? Like, not disrespecting his, like his ring work and stuff like that, but I just don't think there's much more that he can do as a character. I just don't see it. But, um... See, Drew Gulak is one to me that I always liked on 205. Um, but then... 
Oh, would I put him in there? It'd be my see Cedric. I'd I'd put in there because Cedric's great. I think he could nearly have a good match with a lot a majority of the roster. So I put Cedric in there. I'll go Drew Gulak because he's he's pretty he's pretty good. Who'd be? Oh my wow, level? okay. Yeah, I like Drew. He's just got a cool. There's something about his character to me that is just like yeah. Um, and for probably Drew McIntyre. The last Good few choice. months, the last few months, he's been just, he's just someone that's ready to break out. Like he's on that tip of the tip of the iceberg with everything and he's ready to explode. Like he's, but I just, for the sake of things, I hope they don't, A, I hope they don't rush him to any kind of title um, holding the title, but I also hope they don't take too long. There's that fine line. They've just got to find the sweet spot, but they're building him in a very nice way. So yeah, I'd go Drew McIntyre because he's very good. Is that six? Have I got one more? I can't remember. You have one more. I have one more. Um, my last one. Hmm. She's that six one, man. It, it gets you. <laughs> I've just there's a few people that I'm thinking of, but I'm like, is it? Uh... It's definitely definitely the boogeyman. It's, he, he, oh, he would be it. I mean, that was definitely my first thought. Um, let's see. See, I want to say AJ, but I also see Daniel Bryan probably. His last run, I would have said Brian, but Brian's not the same as he was three years ago, in my opinion. So, I'll 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 go AJ Styles. Okay, okay. I mean, just for obvious reasons, I don't think we have to really explain too much with AJ. No. <laughs> but yeah, they greatest were, wrestler right now. He's just he just fires on all cylinders all the time. He's just. He's just um, he's just very good. <laughs> AJ's just very good. Plain and simple. I fear though. I fear though uh, with uh, with AJ and the ruthless aggression era that with his accent and everything, they just make yeah, him like Jimmy White Gang or something. Would, um, <laughs> it probably yeah. I could actually yeah. I could really see that. I tell you what, I, I'm, I'm oh, the face that, that be, runs the place, boy. Oh my god, that would be like every storyline he would be in. They would like be like, "You're southern. You're from Georgia or whatever the hell he's from." Um, <laughs> <laughs> Brock Lesnar just throws him down the steps for no reason. <laughs> oh my <laughs> god, you know what TV. that made me think of? Zach Gowan. Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> and the the F five into the um, ring post. Did, did oh you, man, yeah, his that was, one leg. That that sto- that was a storyline and a half right there. Oh, that very poor choice of words, and I didn't mean it like that. But um, <laughs> I re- <laughs> I really didn't mean it like that. <laughs> poor choice of words. Um, <laughs> guys, I meant the storyline. It was that good. It deserved an extra bit. But um, <laughs> I re- there was a time it didn't have a leg to stand on, did oh. it? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not nice. It's not nice. <laughs> Do you know what? Now I'm getting all this stuff from SmackDown coming to my head. Do you remember the um, t- when Sable and Stephanie were f- having matches, and I believe they had a pay per view match from recollection. Um, I don't remember a pay per view match, but I do remember them feuding, and uh, it was really cringy because Sable looked like an old mom. So. Yeah. And yeah, and oh man, and then not to be not not to down women for, for oh, looks no, no, or no. anything. Oh no, I I get what you mean. Um, so, I don't recall Sable being there for that long. She was only she wasn't around for all that long, was she? No, it was about it's about a year. Yeah, I, I think. And she was there when Stephanie and Vince had that I Quit match. Yep, she was in Vince's corner. Yes, that's right. And Linda was with Stephanie, wasn't she? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they terrible, threw in the towel, and there was lead pipes. There was a lot. Like, Poor Stephanie. S- storylines, storylines, especially on SmackDown for women. You have to talk about Tori Wilson and Dawn Marie. Yeah, I mean that was obviously the one that comes to mind when I think of the SmackDown ladies. 
and you know Al Wilson and all that, and how he died, and then they had the funeral and they fought. And <laughs> I watched I watched their Royal Rumble match, um, Dawn Marie's and Tori Wilson. It's a technical classic. It's um, something else. I Te- believe it's technically a match. Is what you're saying? I mean, I mean, yeah. <laughs> if you want to call it a wrestling match, we'll call it a wrestling match. Technically, you are right, but it is something. Um, <laughs> it's uh, I I put it this way: I could not take my eyes off of it. There you go. So I mean, I guess they're so doing now I something have to see right. This match. Oh, it's it's um. Wait till you get to that. That is a um. I think you will spend Royal Rumble jo- 03, right? Royal Rumble 03, yeah. That is a um. It's a I I sometimes I randomly go on the network and I'll watch like chronologically like. Raw's in 2004, or I watch, you know, SmackDown's in 2003, or whatever it may be, and I'll just go on this little tangent where that's all I watch, um, and earlier this year, it was SmackDown's in 03, and I started, you know, the first episode in January, and, um, yeah, that was the storyline that was, it was prime in, in, uh, into that storyline, and, yeah, they'd all, uh, had that match, and it was, um, it was, yes, it definitely was a wrestling match. <laughs> but, All right, yeah, like Josh, Josh I, I have five more minutes I can give, so we, uh, are, just well, we, you know. we can. Um, this is like a good kind of ending point, anyway, because we've. I'm sure we will chat again, because um, absolutely, this has been more than I could hope for. So, um, I appreciate you um coming on to Wrestling Reverb, and um, I'll give you uh, let you put yourself over. Where can everyone find you and all that kind of deal? Well, everyone can find me, uh, or uh, Kyle and I, on Facebook, uh, the Ruthless Aggression Podcast. Uh, that V is important, because like I said, a lot of jabronis try to podcast about the Ruthless Aggression. No, they're not as committed as we are. <laughs> the Ruthless Aggression Podcast. Uh, you can find us on Twitter, which is where we uh, mainly post our, our tweets and twerps and our memes and all that good stuff. Um, give us an old retweet at, uh, at Ruthless Pod. Uh, Instagram, Ruthless Aggression Podcast. Uh, and we're trying to start a YouTube channel pretty soon. Um, I'm just trying to find time to do that. <laughs> it's the it, yeah, it's, thing. it's finding time for everything. That's the hardest. So, yeah, man, that that's where you can find us. Go and and check uh, out. just quick, oh, yeah. quick shout out to uh, my show with Alex, Alex and Jake. That is our sister cast. So please show them some love. They put on a great show. They're a variety show talk about a plethora of things that's my show with alex and jake on the red arrow network go and everyone go and follow and whatever you whatever you do on the social medias and check out the the podcast because it's it's really good i listen to it all the time i've i um i just recommend everyone to go do it um but yeah i thank you for uh coming on and um we'll definitely chat again soon yes brothers it's it's i i love this partnership this friendship that we have just talking about wrestling Trust me, awesome, man. anyone and that follows more than more than us, give Josh a follow. Do it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, do it. Like I mean, follow I'll make you. Man. I'll make you watch Tori Wilson and Dawn Marie from Raw Rumble 2003 on repeat. If you don't, like, just come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're not that mean. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the Vegemite. That that's what it's doing to me. <laughs> It's a spoonful of Vegemite, man. That's, oh. that's exactly what it is. Oh, I've never heard something so accurate in my life. That is the perfect way to end this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. All righty, everyone. I'll see you next time on Wrestling Reverb. Bye. Bye.